Joining us this portion of our program is Dr. Thomas Fallone. Tom has joined Hieronymus and Company over the years for his work on various energy and technology issues. Tonight we'll focus on the very real issues we face with global warming and its consequences to life on Earth. Dr. Vallone is director, president, and chairman of Integrity Research Institute, a nonprofit corporation dedicated to conscientiously educating the public on new green energy technologies and to help establish research integrity in all of the energy sciences. Tom, it's been a long time since we last spoke. That's right. Yeah, it's been a few years. Yeah, it's just a pleasure to hear you again. Look, so you have been working on a lot of things, um, and I see on your website how broad it is, including, which we'll get to, an upcoming energy conference at the University of Maryland. Talk to us a little bit about, if you don't mind, but as a kid, I have this interest in scientists like you who end up sort of multidisciplinarian. how you decided to become the scientist that you did. Well, I guess it was because I started uh, early in life, and uh, when I was um, cheap or 12 years old, uh, I remember having a chemistry set and um, making all kinds of terrible gases, uh, even hydrogen balloons that exploded in the air, and I did a sulfur dioxide experiment in sixth grade, so I was like a little Mr. Wizard, and I couldn't believe I had to wait so many years to take chemistry in high school, which seemed a long way off. And, uh, but then in, in senior year of college, I, senior year of high school, I decided, oh, physics is much more interesting, so I'm going to go into physics. So, um, so you chose physics, but you have a love of chemistry. How did all of this translate into a professional career? Um, I guess as many careers go, you know, there's a little bit of trial and error involved, but I, I've certainly prayed a lot and also kind of uh, aspired to help the public and have a, a greater cause to saving the world. Um, sort of the hippie generation, you know, coming into mainstream. I got that same disease. I'm going to save the world. <laughs> I, I was certain of it. I once had a teacher who asked me why I was so arrogant. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, who elected you to save the world? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we got it when we were fighting the Vietnam War, right? <laughs> from, the, from the streets. <laughs> Anyways, but, um, but so, yeah, we're still here and we're still fighting. And basically, we've find that there's a lot of areas that are being totally missed by the mainstream politicians and governments and officials and even companies. Well, you um, know, I recall doing my first discussion back in the mid-'80s um, on global warming, and it, it is extraordinary that there are still people in the broadcast industry and in the marketing industry itself that try to convince people that there's nothing going on. So talk to us a little bit about the work that you do in green energy and the latest energy developments. Well, you're skipping over the global warming issue, and I'd certainly like to start with that. Um, <laughs> uh, we just released a 15-minute presentation that's on YouTube, and also it's linkable from our website under news. And it specifically addresses what um, Dr. Jim Hansen uh, produced back in 2006 in Technology Review. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply indebted to him. I even spoke to him in person about it and gave him my annotated version of his map, which is a graph of the last 400,000 years of sea level temperature and CO2. And when you see this graph, which is on our homepage, just scroll down, you'll see his graph and then mine, um, you, you sort of realize, oh my God, all three of those variables are intricately linked and correlated so tightly that if one changes, the other two follow. You so, can't help but come to that conclusion because throughout history, in the half million years I'm talking about, um, this has been proven. We annotated the, um, the data onto one graph so that it's easily um, calibrated. And that was the beauty of his graph in which I actually put a key onto mine to show what the calibration means is a prediction of where we're going based on the increased CO2 that we're now experiencing, which is almost 400 parts per million now. Within a year or so, we're going to actually exceed the 400 parts per million most of the time during the year as we're, as we're doing it so well. Uh, unfortunately, most people, including climatologists, don't know what that means. And so that's why I released this um, uh, YouTube video, because people need to understand there's a history behind it and a predictive quality to Jim Hansen's graph that shows that we can actually anticipate at least a six to seven degree Fahrenheit increase 
based on the CO2 level we have now, and nothing changing, just exactly what we have now, we have to incur a 6 to 7 degree Fahrenheit increase on the Earth. And this enormous sea level rise, which I don't even want to quote because it's too astronomical to believe. Can we go back a little bit for a moment? Um, you described this chart, this graph of Hansen's, and you said that there are three components of it that show us sort of the colossal challenge facing us, and that with increased carbon dioxide and sea levels rising, go through the chart a little bit for us for those that can't see it in front of them. And for those that want to, while we're talking, go to www.integrityresearchinstitute.org. And what is, what is the thing they'll look for on the website? I don't have mine open in front of me. As you scroll down to the bottom of IntegrityResearchInstitute.org, you'll see IRI, our mission. And below that is this atmospheric CO2 picture showing the past uh, three years of February's um, uh, CO2 levels. And right above that is the public. See the most compelling evidence of climate change urgency in the CO2 and climate beast graph. And that was his title for this 400,000-year graph. So that's a good one to start with because you'll see squiggly lines for 400,000 years, and it's pretty much overwhelming. Well, right below that is the IRI climate chart, and that's where you see my teacher quality from community college teaching of trying to explain something very complicated in simple terms. So the what are the components, though? We have the increased carbon dioxide. We have sea levels rising. And what is the third? Sea level, CO2. And temperature. And the temperature. So when let's let's talk um, in really simple terms for people like me who don't do well with numbers. So when we look at the increased carbon dioxide, how much of an increase are we talking about over the, since the last, as you pointed out, it goes back 400,000 years, but how bad has it gotten in the last 50 years? Well, just in the past 50 years, we've gone up a full degree C, which is almost 2 degrees F. And, and it's unfortunate to have that size of an increase because, uh, unfortunately, it, um, it essentially is showing how fast the accelerated temperature is, is going. And, and with populations as large as China now developing an upper class with upper electricity needs and cars, et cetera, and India with its sort of transformation of its own energy – how do these components, including the United States, which is a terrible contributor to all of these problems, when we put this all together, what does it look like for the next 10 to 20 years? Well, it, it, all the experts at least finally agree. In fact, I'm looking at a 2009 Washington Post article that specifically has dire forecast of 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit temperature increase. Um, so they're all agreeing that, that we're into more dangerous territory than the Earth has experienced. And even in the next 10 to 20 years, which is a short period of time, we can literally see another couple degrees increase. Mm. And so when we look at this increase of carbon dioxide and then an increase in temperature, you said the temperatures will get to the point that we'll have extraordinary drought, I guess forest fires, famine, other good things like that. Absolutely. In fact, the National Geographic did a, a very interesting uh, documentary on, um, on six degrees. Uh, they actually uh, d described the, the video as a six-degree change and, and essentially tried to show what the extreme would be. And every degree has major changes in, on the Earth. When we add to it sea levels rising, so as it warms and the ice caps melt and the permafrost melts and things collapse and we get more water, what level sea rises are we talking about are in this report? <laughs> well, I have to admit that, that we're talking about Jim Hansen, the beleaguered climatologist from NASA and MIT, who's, who's got tremendous accolades. He was persecuted throughout the Bush administration and then rewarded as as he finally uh, was recognized for his work. Um, and, and due to his work alone, and as I say, this uh, annotated IRI climate chart, we can actually show that the past 400,000 years have the correlated uh, three variables we're talking about, the sea level, CO2, and temperature. And so as we look at 377 or even 400 parts per million, we can literally tell the exact correlation 
In other words, 10 parts per million equals half a degree C equals 10 meters of sea level rise. Wow. That's the key to the graph. And then, unfortunately, it becomes unbelievable because, you know, the temperature is 7 degrees predicted. And I sat with that for three years until the Washington Post article came out that actually quoted Clim uh, Climate Committee from um, inter intergovernmental panel and also a European group that had a 4 degrees C prediction, which is about the same as the 6 or 7 degrees F. So I was vindicated only three years later right. by interpreting Jim Hansen's graph here. But the sea level, which is what your big question here is about, the sea level rise predicted by this graph is 80 meters. Which translates to what in feet for those of us not trained in this <laughs> translation from meters to feet? Approximately uh, multiply by three, and you get to this extraordinary number of 240 feet, but uh, nobody even wants to believe it's a couple hundred feet of sea level rise. People won't even believe that eight feet is possible unless it's a hurricane like Sandy. Right, you know, exactly. I, I've always said it's interesting because, you know, I've, I've been a broadcaster now for about 30 years. And when I had my daily Zo show and covered world affairs and would talk about a very broad spectrum of issues, but one of them was floods and hurricanes and watching Haiti and other island nations go underwater and then billions of dollars being poured in to rebuild them, I would always say, why don't we spend the money and relocate everybody to higher ground? And, and yet it's interesting how, as a humanity, we refuse to accept bad news, which makes me understand why the prophets of old weren't listened to because who wants to hear bad news? So let's talk about this because I think it's one of the major factors that gets in the way of humanity jumping on board the good ship lollipop and doing the good things we need to do. What is it about science that is disconnected from common culture? Or what does it? Is the media? Is it the, the big oil industries? Is it the nuclear organizations? I mean, what is it that keeps the the general public from realizing the calamities we are facing? Well, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a worldwide problem. And in fact, in Greece, um, uh, recently, a uh, few, um, uh, actually, they're a, a seismologists, uh, were put in jail. <laughs> and, um, and this is a, a, a precedent because... Uh, because they told the public that there were going to be greater and greater earthquakes? Uh, yes, but they didn't do enough to warn the public to take action. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that sort of bodes well for the rest of the world in terms of scientific um, responsibility. And, and that's why our institute uh, is really uh, striving to educate the public. Well, we but, and, the, uh, but you do a lot of testimony, and you talk a lot to Congress and, and, the, and the D.C. Carter kind of policymaking groups. What is going on that this stuff is not taken seriously enough and instead we have like the fracking industry a new gas industry being promoted as some sort of savior for our planet i mean i i don't really get it you know since a kid i have so loved the earth and as an activist have so tried to like you know sound the horn i don't understand our society in this respect yes i agree with you well, to bring out the, the good news rather than dwell too much on the bad news here, um, I, I can uh, at least direct people to our Future Energy e-news, which we send out for free every month, and you can subscribe for free on our homepage. And what's interesting is we recently had a story that was uh, based on a, a scientific discovery that there's a, a generator that actually uses CO2 and, and converts that into a... Um, a process of oxygen and, and carbon so that it's, it's actually uh, absorbing and sequestering CO2 wow. while it's generating energy. That's wonderful. So are, are, do you think this younger generation of scientists who sort of haven't been colored by World War II, the military strategy, and nuclear war in general, are looking at these issues as resources rather than problems, just like you described? Yes. Actually, uh, one of my books is Zero Point Energy Fuel of the Future, and I get inquiries all the time from graduate students and, and upperclassmen in college who really need some guidance to, to design their uh, curriculum because there aren't any <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in the zero-point energy quantum vacuum uh, field. But um, the, the exciting part, for example, uh, just to um, uh, jump on that same theme of young people, is the Nexus Global Youth Summit. And, and what is that? With that, it comes out of the um, Search for Common Cause 
uh, Search for Common Ground uh, nonprofit that's over in Connecticut Avenue in D.C. That's wonderful. I'm in touch with the uh, global director of this Nexus Global Youth Summit, uh, Jonah Whitcamper, and uh, he's inviting me to be a speaker at the United Nations at their next conference. Well, congratulations. That's a, a lovely comment to you know your ability to have stayed the course and to have brought so many people together. Look, we have to take a little break. When we come back, I want to talk about that because that's one of the things that you've been so wonderful at doing. We'll be right back. Our guest is Dr. Tom Vallone. He's director of the Integrity Research Institute. You can sign up for their monthly e-news. Go to integrityresearchinstitute.org. With the increase of carbon dioxide, temperatures rising, and sea level risings, we're talking about enormous changes for planet Earth. But, Tom, because you've been so involved all these years in future energy as well as low-energy nuclear reactions and electrogravatic systems and things I probably can't pronounce properly, how would you describe the change that's happened in your own lifetime as a scientist? Well, um, that's a big question, and to put it simply, I I find myself more and more um, uh, passionately involved in the um, future energy changes that I see around me. Um, We we literally, and you'll see in this video in the very beginning, um, that I, for the first time, come out and admit uh, that I seem to be about 20 years ahead of my time. Uh Uh-huh. Join the party. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly what I've always said about my own life. See, I think we have more in common than we knew. (laughs) Well, it, it, you can only tell after the evidence comes out. Then you say, "Oh, well, that was about twenty years ago when I was publishing yeah. that stuff." Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's that's the fact of the matter, and and it's strange because, of course, you know, in 1999, I, I got uh, fired from my government job for trying to have a future energy conference within the Commerce uh, Department. Really? Yeah, yeah, that was all over the news. You can Google it; it's on our website as well. The Conference on Future Energy still goes on, but um, the first one was um, a devil call, a debacle. Wow. Well, you've had six, or this is your sixth coming up? That's right. And this Conference on Future Energy, talk to our audience a little bit about the kinds of scientists that come and the purpose of these these group gatherings. Well, the exciting part is that we tend to attract scientists who actually are penetrating into the emerging energy sciences. Our main focus of our institute is energy, propulsion, and bioenergetics. So within those three fields, there is a lot of growth. And these field, three fields, I feel, are vital to the human race uh, uh, sustainability. So um, I tend to focus on energy primarily, but the propulsion changes are very dramatic and worth supporting. And the bioenergy changes, like electrotherapy, are also very vital and worth supporting. Well, you know, when I think about all the years of looking at various things with experts such as yourself, and when I look at the change as you commented, it seems that this awareness that everything is vibration and it's about transmutation and transformation, that that would make the connection between our energy needs, propulsion, and bioenergetics. And then having interviewed so many experts in the field of UFOs and what has been suppressed from public knowledge but not from military um, journals, so to speak, or military papers, tell us is that some of these technologies have been around perhaps in other spectrums of life, maybe in an off-planet civilization. Well, you're certainly pushing me into that area of... Um of, of fringe science, and I'm happy to go there. Um, well, the, the reason I mention it is that Nikolai Tesla, who we both have a passion for, and you know far more about his actual work than I do, but I've interviewed a lot of scholars on his life, and one of the things he would say is that he got his information from Mars. And now, when NASA is doing their work, they're finding all kinds of evidence of life on Mars, and then you add to it others, you know, who have done work on what they've seen in the images on Mars, the face and pyramid, the tunnels, the glass towers, the things that look like animal effigies, that it seems very clear there was life on Mars at another time. Well, sure. Uh, and, and without dwelling too much in archaeology, um, I, I would tend for our uh, listeners to kind of bring it to the, um, to the present. And the book I wrote, uh, Harnessing the Wheelwork of Nature, on uh, Tesla's uh, uh, Science of Energy, uh, is really a good um, a summary of, for example, the uh, wireless transmission of power and the various uh, Tesla technologies that include electrotherapy. 
Um, and, and certainly, you know, we can't get to Mars right now with the present technologies, but there's evidence that the Black Project um, uh, developments are actually uh, capable of travel to Mars. Mm -hmm. Advocating for years the declassification of at least one technology every year, and I've talked to people in very high places in the government to at least encourage them to consider that process so that civilians can benefit from the billions of dollars we've paid in tax dollars for the um, black projects to develop them and back engineer them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and when you look at the, I want to return for a moment, if you don't mind, to global warming and these concomitant ingredients of increased carbon dioxide, sea level rises in temperature. Talk to us a little bit about some of the solutions you envision. Well, uh, uh, just to um, emphasize, too, the uh, the government now has a globalchange.gov. Uh, it's a new national report that is um, available for public comment until April 12th. Global, globalchange.gov? Right. Okay. That's right. And NCADAC is the um, national um, committee. In fact, it's the Federal Advisory Committee Draft Climate Assessment Report. Um, on the National Committee Assessment and Development Advisory Committee. <laughs> uh, all right. NCADC stands for. So this has become uh, big news, and the graphs they show in just the executive summary um, corroborate what we just talked about. So this is serious, and, and also it's not just um, our institute that has uh, pioneered it. Even though we were the first to announce it years ago, it's now being um, mainstreamed by these national committees. So the solutions, which you asked me about, are many, and, and each month we make sure to, um, uh, to indicate them and to advertise them as best we can. For example, photovoltaics. Photovoltaics now have had breakthroughs so significant that we've reached 50 percent efficiency. What does that mean to the average person? Well, it means that uh, years ago when somebody would consider putting uh, solar panels on the roof, they would get a quote of so many tens of thousands of dollars that they would give up. Right. And they would know that there's no payback in the near future that would pay for all of that. Right. Well, now with 50% efficiency, you can go to a much smaller square footage and still get a tremendous amount of input, which, of course, today is even more um, attractive with, the a, a double meter on your home so you can sell um, electricity back to the power company. So um, like Germany, for example, um, we can actually go into business, so to speak, in uh, generating our own energy and making some money at it. Well, that was a, leads me to another question I had in mind earlier, is how other countries are addressing these very real serious problems we face of sea levels rising, of temperatures increasing, carbon dioxide multiplying. What are other countries doing to address their energy needs that we're not doing in the United States yet? Well... It's interesting to follow some of the developments. For example, Germany used to be um, a leader right. in, in, reach, in striving for and almost reaching um, a zero emission uh, standard. And unfortunately, when all of a sudden the uh, Japanese um, uh, meltdown happened with the nuclear reactors, uh, Germany and Japan have had uh, cold feet about uh, having nuclear reactors. So Germany has been shutting down their nuclear reactors stopping the generation of electricity with nukes, and unfortunately gone back to emitting more carbon than they ever did in, in recent years. Well, so, is it, uh, wouldn't there be some other technology that is neither nuclear or oil-based that would benefit the planet that already exists but for some reason is suppressed? I mean, I've always had this feeling that ocean water is so plentiful. Why aren't we using that as a fuel source for everything? Absolutely. In fact, there's several ways to do that. Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, or OTEC, has been around for decades. Even when I taught environmental science back in the 1980s, it was a, a major demonstration uh, off, off the coast of Hawaii. Um, but more recently, the, the very popular way to use ocean energy is tidal power. Right. And off the coast of Norway are the biggest tidal power generators that have ever been submerged into the ocean uh, on the Earth, literally. And we've had stories and pictures of them in that uh, Future Energy E-News archive that people can see. So, um, so the, the world is catching up. Offshore windmills, for example, Maryland is now finally authorizing for the first time this week the testing of offshore sites mm -hmm. for windmills. 
can't, um, and they're so far away, they're designed to be far enough away so that they can hardly be seen. And still they'd be generating uh, megawatts of power. What, what other kinds of technologies have you seen elsewhere in the world that make sense that are water-related? I mean, it just, it's just, you know, I'm not a scientist, and I flunk science pretty much my whole life, and I know you love chemistry. I had a walking pneumonia and took a drug that made me drowsy and coughed for two semesters and have no idea how to combine anything, and it terrified me anyway. So when you look around the world at what people are doing with water or ocean water or the sun, tell us some of the other things you've noticed. Well, there's there's quite a few, and and in fact, uh, I I um, hesitate to go too much into the conventional renewable because everyone. Right. Yeah. Um, instead, what we true try to do is look at the fringe future energy that to me is spectacular. Yeah, that's what interests me too. So tell us about the fringe spectacular things that are in the future, but we see them now. Well, you're uh, asking me about water. So here's here's hot off the press, um, January 2013, new scientist. Uh, and I even got the Nature ma- as a Science Magazine article that originally was quoted from this. And the title of this one is Polymers Slips Ring Electricity from a Wet Surface. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like one of those kids in your class. I don't get it, Professor Vallone. The, the spectacular part of this is we've actually discovered free energy from, from water. Wow. That's exactly what the article states. This is the first article I've ever come across where they don't quite explain sufficiently how water sitting on a surface, any surface, can cause a polymer to continually move and dry itself and flip back and forth, back and forth, until some scientist said, gee, I could put a piezoelectric generator on this darn thing and start generating electricity, which he did, and generated nanowatts from the one single polymer that was flipping back and forth, back and forth. You know what it sounds like when you describe it to me, the way our human body works between electricity and water in driving information to the brain. Possibly, but there's other um, factors. In well, it. I'm sure. I'm very simple, though. I, I look at patterns. I never really get all the particulars. So when we when we see then that there are people really focused on free energy, which Nikolai Tesla also said he had discovered, um, what are some of the things I noticed in your peer-reviewed papers that you are bringing together at your new conference on spring? Space Propulsion, Future Energy, Astrosociology. Oh, I love that one. Astrosociology. What is that? Well, it involves a group of um, professors and grad students that try to um, intellectualize what contact with extraterrestrial civilizations will be like and what are the barriers and, and problems. Uh, How beautiful. Logical interactions. That is just beautiful. Is that actually discussed in colleges now? Yes, and, and I hate to say it, and I, I don't want to dismiss or, or detract from their work because it's very valuable, but it tends to be a very collegiate type of uh, exercise. In other words, no facts or figures uh-huh. from the UFO community are allowed into this. Well, that's crazy. They should just go interview the thousands of abductees and contactees that are it's here on Earth all over the world. <laughs> It's only sitting there and trying to figure things out on your own. <laughs> wow, that is collegiate, isn't it? We're in our ivory tower. Why bother asking the madding crowd? So when you then look at space propulsion, I mean, I was thinking about how the Internet came from our space program. Isn't that right? Yes, yes. Actually, as did Velcro, right. as I recall, reading the history of that. There, And as you point out, these are like publicly funded research societies that each of us pays with with our taxes. What are the other things that you are looking at that you think have really great hope? Well, actually, we do have, um, I, I don't know if anyone's seen the Thrive video from Foster Gamble, but um, I was in, interviewed for that and also recently talked to Foster about what he wants to do next. What do, You know, I did see that film, and I have to say, having covered a lot of the conspiratorialist theories, I agreed with some of what was said, and some of it was not the conclusion I came to after 30 years of looking at all those issues. But it, because I don't know that moving into the fear band about change is helpful to anybody. But tell us about Foster Gamble's next project. What are you going to be working on? Well, that, that to me is the important part, and that's why yes. I'm bringing that, that topic in, is that you know, certainly he's laid the groundwork for doing something positive. Right. Thank you. And what's come out of that is he has a wonderful website that actually 
kind of uh, pulls all the people together throughout the world that are interested in contributing to the Thrive Movement. And so that, uh, to me, is a great start. But what we're looking at, actually, is um, a repository for proposals that he's actually willing to um, almost hand carry to a bunch of benefactors who have now contacted him and asked him, how can we help? That's a beautiful phenomenon. You know, I think of all the things that the Internet has done, it's really made this cross-fertilization and collaboration between like-minded people possible, when otherwise most of us never would have met. Right. It's, it's extraordinary. Now, I noticed in your upcoming conference, again, under one roof at the University of Maryland, and you're calling for papers, or is, are the papers period over? No, no, they're still, it's still open. Okay, so in these peer-reviewed papers, I saw another one called Space Elevators, what are yeah. space elevators? This just all sounds like so much like the Jetsons. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a real project, and even the um, uh, Space Society uh, conference uh, has had um, speakers on that topic. Um, what what has turned out uh, is there's even patents, for example, on them. And and what's turned out to be the problem is that if you try to put a couple miles of anything uh, from the Earth up into the uh, high ionosphere. You're, you're essentially um, dealing with so much uh, stressful uh, forces yeah. that only the, um, uh, the graphite type of um, graphene and, and various uh, nanotubes are capable of handling that, that much force. But luckily, that's exactly what's being patented today, is the ability to create a, um, carbon nanotube rope and twine and uh, ribbon so that we can actually someday envision a space elevator that will be capable of uh, at least getting something up to the level where it will cost very little to launch it from uh, the near space uh, region. That's beautiful. That reminds me of those tubes at the bank where you you know put your money in and it goes through a tube into the teller inside, only this is a much more elaborate design. <laughs> it's really sort of for those of us that are simple-minded. That's what it reminds me of. And what about beamed power? I mean, you all sound like your science fact from science fiction, but it's here now. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, really, the beamed power, uh, if we focus just on the space solar power, um, that our institute also has been advocating and keeping track of how this movement has been developing. It was the United States idea. It was first developed here, and I remember... Um, uh, back at MIT days, there was a, a scientist who actually promoted it and wrote a book on Earth colonies um, that uh, was essentially uh, proposing the entire dynamics of it uh, back in the 1970s, I believe. So um, ever since then, uh, various nations have talked about it, and it turns out Japan's going to be the first one to have it by the end of this decade. What does it mean, though? I don't quite understand what beamed power is. Well, it's, uh, the first thing to point out, and, and this even the Pentagon has had their promotional package for the same uh, project, and that is uh, the public should realize is that if you take any square meter of solar panel, photovoltaic solar panel, you can get so many kilowatts at the Earth level. And if you put it out in space, you get 10 times the kilowatts <laughs> for the same square footage. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so there's a huge advantage there to have the same oh, I see what you here. mean. Okay, so the receiver is up in space beaming power back down to us. Yes, through microwaves. That's right. Oh, beautiful. You know, it's so strange. You know, because I have sort of a artistic mind and I'm a pattern researcher, which is how I did investigative reporting as well as other things that have interested me in life, is I can always see things in images. So I've always wondered why, for instance, like I mentioned earlier, we're not using ocean water for, for water engines, whether it's our car or our house. It just seems so simple to figure out the chemistry of what happens in the sodium transport. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my simple mind. And then the other one was in terms of solar um, sheets and the use of solar energy of why we can't bring it down like almost like a funnel from a big wide aperture into a very narrow one which anybody who ever sifts flour or something knows it's a very fine but but stronger point and somebody said that the israelis are doing something like that and that the solar energy panels are so hot that they boil salt which, again, is back to the sodium. So I don't know enough about it to even know if that makes sense, but I hope that made some sense to you, what I was saying. Yeah, 
Yeah. Actually, the Israelis are also working on a very interesting piezoelectric generator for highways. Right. And I'm very uh, pleased to say that they're in the kilowatt range as well. Uh, so it's a very exciting invention. I just hope that we see it in this country as piezoelectric well. Piezoelectric meaning it has salt somehow in it? Well, no. Piezo means that it's converting a force into electricity, much like that polymer that was bending. Oh, got it. Okay. So it's, it's, um, and, and to bring it home to the human body, every bone in your body is piezoelectric. And that's why weight-bearing exercise is very important for older people to make sure you don't develop osteoporosis. Yeah, you know, along those lines, for those who feel they can't do the exercise, also tapping on your bones or your jaw helps stimulate the cells also. We'll be right back. Our guest is Dr. Tom Vallone. He's director of the Integrity Research Institute. We began our conversation about climate change. You can see his YouTube video on this subject. It's linked right on the front page of our website, 21st21stcenturyradio.com. But to follow all these more extraordinary topics that I certainly try to understand but don't always, go to Integrity. IntegrityResearchInstitute.org. Tom Vallone is our guest. Zero Point Energy, the fuel of the future. Hey, Tom, coming back to all the amazing things on your website and your upcoming conference that will be co-sponsored, is it, with the University of Maryland? Well, no. Or at the University of Maryland. We have a few professors uh, every year from the university, but no, we're an independent conference. Okay, so it'll just be there. So when you look at all of these different things around the world going on, in this particular um, conference, you have Human Mission to Mars, New Energy, Propulsion, NASA Advanced Concepts, Bioelectromagnetics, Life Extension, Gravitomagnetics, Anti-Gravity, et cetera, et cetera, and some other things we talked about already. Can we shift our focus for a moment to bioelectromagnetics? Why, sure. All right. So talk to us a little bit about, because, you know, when I interviewed, oh, my gosh, it's got to go back 30 years, um, and now I'm all of a sudden forgetting the wonderful doctor up in New York who did all the beautiful early work with salamanders. You'll remember his name. But in any event... Becker. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Becker, which he did, and he inspired so many of us so early on to realize that the future of medicine would probably be vibrational medicine. What is bioelectromagnetics? The bioelectromagnetic topic is, uh, there's also a society, bioelectromagnetic society, um, specifically describing the bigger picture of what the human body consists of. We're very familiar with the uh, chemical gradients and um, chemical um, pharmaceuticals that are a billion-dollar industry, but very few people even realize there's a voltage or electricity gradient that's equally as important in the human body. Which people who ever have heart trouble know when the heart goes irregularly or goes too fast. Well, even more importantly, across every cell membrane, it's 10 million volts per meter or 100,000 volts per centimeter is the normal voltage gradient that every cell in your body likes to maintain. Well, so if you're feeling low energy, it's possible you don't have enough electrons. And I'm one of the few that have actually uh, advertised and discovered that electrons are antioxidants. So there are many microcurrent methods, and even on our website, bioenergydevice.org, you can see devices that are high voltage designed to recharge those transmembrane potentials in the body. Wow, that sounds so simple that it's unbelievable. And and so then what about when we're constantly in this flux of the 60 of of the energy grid or dealing with the electromagnetic vibrations from high power lines or the electromagnetic flux of the earth? Are are we getting overstressed? Do you think this has something to do with the cancer rate in the world? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's plenty of evidence even back to 1987 when the first um uh, a report came out from the New York State, um, uh, and it was, it was essentially the power line uh, magnetic field report. But uh, since then, even cell phones have been targeted, and there's a, there was a huge cell phone study, a $10 million uh, type of um, study that was done just recently. And what's interesting even about that study, which is cited in my book, Bioelectromagnetic Healing, is that the uh, the study overall indicated that if you keep your cell phone near your head or near your body for hours at a time while it's on, you're basically seeing a higher cancer risk in the group of people that were studied. However, if you do it 15 minutes or 20 minutes every day or less, you actually have more protection from cancer and a lower cancer risk than the average. 
throughout the population. Because what? It's like getting a low dose of poison in our body. It just, I mean, why would the cell phone using it just a little bit better than not using it all? Is that what you're inferring? Absolutely. I'm applying that and, and actually um, uh, 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 specifically uh, stating that as a fact. See, the interesting part about bioelectromagnetics, and we're working on a textbook to really help the public understand these principles, is that it's just like selenium and zinc, and you can go down the list of vitamins. In small doses, they're good for you. Vitamin A is another example. In large doses, they're toxic. It's the same thing throughout uh, nature. And, and when we're dealing with small amounts of electromagnetic, high voltage, high frequency, even x-rays. I have an article on my wall, pasted on my wall, that healthy x-rays are actually possible in small doses mm-hmm. because the body needs frequencies. It absorbs them and stores them, and they even get stored in the DNA so biophotons can be broadcast throughout the body. And it's all in my book, Bioelectromagnetic Healing. I need one of those. I'm going to have to get one. Because, you know, it really, really, really captured my interest in the 80s when I was in my 20s. And um, was I in my 20s then? No. Yeah. No, I was in my 30s. No, I can't remember. (laughs) That has never been my strength. When When you look at the reality of the ancients, who healed with color, with gemstones, like they did in India and still do many gem therapy. It's all based on vibration. And one of the things that has interested me most was the way we come into rapport with each other when the hearts come into each other's field. That's a bioelectric phenomena, is it not? Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, we share infrared radiation when we get close to each other, husband and wife that cuddle in bed. You're actually benefiting each other by the exchange of radiation. So um, uh, all of that is well known, but what's not well known is that how a single person, for example, can use one of our premier juniors up close and actually get a dose of antioxidants right into the skin and subcutaneously help uh, quench free radicals on site. Well, wow, that was a sentence. Okay, go back. You have a product that a person listening to the audience can purchase from your organization? Yes. And what is it called? It's called the Premier Junior. And what does the Premier Junior look like and do? Well, it's, uh, Premier stands for Photonic Rejuvenation Energizing Machine and Immunizing Electrification Radiator, just in case you were going to ask. But... <laughs> Okay, I love the word premiere, though. I can remember that one. That's, that's why the acronym works so well. <laughs> yes, it does. You are such an interesting man. Thank you. But it basically does, um, it's a one foot long uh, tubular device, um, um, much like any other um, uh, home uh, uh, appliance, perhaps it's handheld. But the important thing is it has a noble gas tube on the end that lights up with high voltage. And you can put it anywhere on your body. Wow. It's so wonderful. You know, I don't know if you know a gentleman by the name of John Whale in England. Nope. You should look him up. J-O-N Whale. He has an institute on bioenergetics, and I interviewed him years ago about something he calls the assemblage point, which is sort of um, an etheric body center, a little bit away from the heart, but in in that part of the body that can be put out of joint um, through accident or trauma, depression, illness, etc. And he works also with bioelectrics. You know, it reminds me a little bit of the early work of the radionics um, creators like Albert Abrams, who understood that there's not only just a physical frequency, but there's a subtle frequency that we don't necessarily measure with our tools. Well, that may be true, but we don't have to go into that subtle area because this is mainstream um, energy science that was actually invented 100 years ago. Uh, Nikola Tesla is is, um, uh, credited for having some of the first Tesla coil therapy units, which he actually published uh, on the topic in Buffalo, New York, at the electrotherapy uh, conferences he spoke at. Are are there any doctors? We actually have uh, Dr. Tusi. Um, several uh, vol- several chapters of his volume, over uh, 400 pages worth on a CD, of his electrotherapy practice using high-voltage Tesla coils. Boy, you are a university in itself. Research, Integrity Research Institute.org. We are almost out of time in a, in a silly kind of, not silly, but my playful kind of question. Is there any invention you've seen in your mind that you haven't yet been able to develop? 
Oh, quite a few. <laughs> uh, it's a small, short list of uh, wonderful things. For example, uh, a beamed energy device that's called an impulse gravity generator. Pod Kladinov invented it, and he's already trying to commercialize it. And we could use it to deflect incoming asteroids, which, as we know, are tending to head toward the Earth quite often. Right, which we need. I've interviewed Paula Violet and others who have talked about this tar- true galactic center explosion as well as solar flares, et cetera. What else? I, I, I love talking to you. It's like I'm just having so much fun. Well, there's an osteopad that we're actually currently working with a couple developers with, and the osteopad is designed to help 50% of the population that will be at risk by 2020 for osteoporosis. And it simply provides the electrical piezoelectric frequency as you sleep that provides calcium transport into the bones. I need one of those. (laughs) I'm making my list, Tom, of all the things the Integrity Research (laughs) Institute can supply. I really, I thank you so much for your passion, your love of teaching, of bringing together all these different fields to really foster a future for our Earth. You you do a beautiful job, and I'm glad that by the time of 12, you too knew you were here to save the world. Well, thanks very much. Go to www.integrityresearchinstitute.org and find out how you can be part of Saving Our World. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus, and remember, we do need more love in the world.